Hello and welcome to the common response for US treated cruisers in war and retrospect and um, honestly I was expecting to be more comments on the video. I was. I was expecting there to be more comments on the video. And by the way, if you're thinking the lighting's a bit weird, um, well, the, the ring light I normally use has decided to stop working, so I thought I'd just carry on recording and do shameless book plugs uh, using the light of the screens and my own dappled lights to cover and I'll figure out the uh, ring lights issues tomorrow. It's an LED one, it should be working. So, let's start off from the first comment. Jack Ray, thank you. Thank you, Jack Ray. So, Ryan Crash, Year of the Cruiser. Is that the Year of the Dog or Year of the Tiger? Uh, year of the Cruiser has been a great series. Thank you for Haitian Space Program. And thank you, Ryan Crash. And Wayne's World of Science. More like a Year of Hood. Adrian's Hood was the ultimate cruiser. Mm, Adrian's Hood was a battle cruiser, one word. If you want the ultimate cru battle cruiser, two words, then you're probably looking at uh, good old Lexington class because... Yeah, that's what they were. And they're good at it. I've done a video about them in the Key Ship series. They are good. Tim Simmons, I always enjoy listening to you, Dr. Clark. Especially enjoy watching you and Drac run around on the museum ships. That's going to be going on while this when this video comes out, so I hope you're enjoying that. I regret no longer being in a position to be a patron of the channel at the moment, but circumstances change for better soon. I hope they do, and... I'm just glad you still watch the channel. Honestly, that's what I enjoy. I couldn't do all I do without the support of everyone on Patreon and subscribe channel and all those things, but... Shalene, I didn't watch the Cruise series and all this, but finally caught up. Thank you for doing these. One thing I'd love to see is a more in-depth comparison between the US and Royal Navy ships and the philosophy behind them. You do talk about it, but it tends to stay at a high level. Well, the philosophy behind them is sort of an interesting area, and I'll get into that now in this, record this recording, I think. The Royal Navy cruisers, you have to think about as being a maid of all work. Okay? They are 90% of them able to do 90% of missions. They are a 70% solution for 90% of the missions. That's pretty much the Royal Navy's philosophy. The US Navy looks at their cruisers and looks at them more and more as part of their scouting force, especially their what will be called heavy cruisers once the 8 inch gun is decided to make the heavy cruiser um, they're looking at more and more, especially their early ones are part of their scouting force, their reconnaissance assets and this evolves into a fighting asset, so they evolve from being orientated around scouting, so very fast very, sh uh, very narrow hulls for maximum speed very efficiency through the water is the most important thing to being something which is an all-around combatant. But it's about the fighting side of the cruiser role more than the high-speed reconnaissance part of the cruiser role. And this is the real sort of scenario, because if you consider the cruiser having... I would argue four principal mission sets. Presence being one of them. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller while I sort of do this discussion. Presence, fighting other cruisers, reconnaissance, and leadership. The Royal Navy aims for a vessel to try and get as close to the middle as possible, to doing all those roles. Because they never know which vessels they're going to have available for any operation, but they presume they're going to have a few of them. That's the whole reason they want 70 or so. They want to have a few of them. So, that's their scenario. US Navy goes, right then, we'll have some which are for the reconnaissance, sort of disposition over here, for reconnaissance scouting. And they're also going to do, they're going to do some of the flagship and some of the leadership. So they're going to be in sort of this part of the, the, the square. They're not going to be slightly as armoured or organised for fighting. But that's fine. Because, as part of the scouting force, we're also going to have ships like the USS Texas. Which is going to go, yeah. You want to take on my peeps? You really want to mess with my scout cruisers? Because then I, you're going to mess with me and I'm Texas. So, that's part of the philosophy. 
you you the Royal Navy is pursuing is dealing with a scenario where they are spread around the world, and they can have to be doing all things at all times, and they don't know quite sure which ones are going to be which. The U.S. Navy is far more able to organize its fleet. It's far more able to go scouting fleet, battle fleet, scouting fleet, battle fleet, and their organization and where the cruisers fit in that role. Now, this works while cruisers are taking the lead in the scouting role. Once you start having aircraft take over the lead in the scouting role, suddenly those scouting-orientated cruisers start to look not so useful. Because they can't transition back into the fighting role. The US Navy sort of almost overcompensates because they move their ships back into the sort of this part of the triangle, uh, this part of the square. And sort of this one up here. So they're able to do presence, they're able to do the fighting, and you know, they're able to do the presence, fighting, and sort of all these sort of roles. But they're less good at the reconnaissance one. They're not as good at going forward. And they're not as good at going forward solo. And one of the things you have to consider about the US Navy the whole way through on this sort of scenario is that they're either depending upon speed to save them, speed to save them from issues, or they're depending on the wider group to save them from issues. They are not ever really designed for independent solo operations in terms of persistent threat engagement. What do I mean by this? Well, one of the reasons why the earlier heavy cruisers are not fitted with later on with hydrophones or as or sonar like the British cruisers are fitted with is because they're supposed to be going fast enough they can keep away from enemy submarines and they're zigzag and they're basically going to go get the information and get out. And then when you've got the fighting cruisers, well, they're going to always have destroyers around them. So you can save that space, you can save those personnel, you can save all the accoutrements that go with on fitting that equipment and use it for something else. Because even when you're not limited by treaty, you are still limited. By just size of yards and space of manufacture and fitting out yards. And crew and personnel and logistics and all these things affect you. So that's really it. I, I hope that's not sort of on too a high level. It's basically, if you go through the individual and look at the classes and look at their differences, you can often explain them by going, right then, so this is a general purpose cruiser. It's not going to be brilliant in any area, but it's going to be pretty darn good. It's a seventy. It's for ninety percent. It's able to do. It's a seventy percent solution for ninety percent of the missions. And the American ship is usually a ninety percent solution for about twenty-five, forty percent of the missions, and a forty percent solution for the remainder. Let's go. Let's go fifty-fifty. Let's go. Sort of. There are about ninety percent solution for fifty percent of missions, and about a forty percent solution for the remaining fifty. Because of the compromises to get them up to that ninety percent solution, so they're often better at doing the task they're designed for than the British cruiser. But they're worse at doing the mission they're not designed for than the British cruiser. And it's, it's your choice. It's what you can do. when you have enough ships, and when you're able to orientate them enough. The US Navy had the benefit of being able to theoretically build to the same size as the Royal Navy, whilst not having the same imperial global commitments that the Royal Navy had. That's a benefit. The US Navy is not the world's policeman at that point. The Royal Navy still was. Modern 6292, hello. Your description on the we, on the we won, we negotiate now is absolutely perfect. Yeah, it's it's the problem with a lot of a lot of 
history and a lot of diplomatic history is that some nations do have a habit of thinking and cultures have a sort of idea of we have a fight then we negotiate and others have a case of no we negotiate once we've won and crushed you and if you haven't crushed us we're still fighting and I'm not sure I think every culture has it within them to be that way but not every culture has had maybe the leadership or the unity to actually deliver on that in my from my study of history so far and I must admit I'm a naval historian so I'm looking at this normally through the lens of conflicts which have involved the naval or sea power so there is that codifier okay that's what I'm looking at it from but from Chicago I know I brought it up in a couple of other videos but since we're summing up US free cruisers they aren't really cruisers are they I'm not entirely sure what they are. Maybe third class battleships, maybe really small battle cruisers. Regardless, the Ustrida cruisers are not designed for independent cruising operations. They're not designed to empower the captain. The Ustrida cruiser needs a destroyer escort. If a cruiser needs an escort, it's not a cruiser. It's a doctrinal problem. For example, the US cruisers can't do the 70% anti-submarine escort role. They also can't track sonar. They have difficulty with combat operations at night. Okay. So, the combat operation at night thing mostly depends on leadership, and sometimes, like at Tassafaronga, the US Navy leadership is really problematic, and so that gives their cruise ships a bad name. I would say they're designed to fulfill their version of the cruiser roles. You shouldn't really compare them with the British cruisers, because the British cruisers, as said, are a 70% solution for 90% of the missions. And the British don't have sonar or ASDIC, as the British would call it, or hydrophones to track submarines. They do not want cruisers tracking submarines. They have it to listen for torpedoes because of Abaca, Cressy, and Hogue and the way they got sunk. As I've said in a few videos. That's the legacy. The US Navy didn't lose cruisers like that. And the US Navy thought, well, with proper subdivision and everything, they could avoid it. And with them acting properly, i.e. zigzagging and you know, moving at high speed, they would never suffer that fate. So they didn't need it. Now, you can disagree with that one, especially in light of the Long Lance and various other things, but that was an assumption they made and there was logic behind it. That doesn't make their ships not cruisers. Just means their doctrinal use of cruisers was less about the cruising role and more about the attributes cruisers bring to other parts of their mission. I.e. the high-speed reconnaissance asset. You can call it as sort of really small battle cruisers, but of course, the US Navy had lost their battle cruisers. The Lexington class aren't built. So that means their cruisers, especially their 8-inch cruisers that are built that are built in their said in 1920s, really have to step up to fulfill that role. That scout force role of being high speed reconnaissance assets. Trouble is they long, no longer have the support they used to have they would have hopefully had in the Lexington world. So, I can understand where you're coming from, but I disagree, because the US Navy cruisers were cruisers. They were just built differently, and the doctrine was different. And the reasons for the doctrine being different are down to the geostrategic circumstances of the USA versus the UK. Spencer Jones. Honestly, I wonder if the 8-inch gun turrets on Lexington's could have been used to build a pair of light, uh, of heavy cruisers pretty quickly in the late 30s, and for that matter, the 6-inch turrets on the Nelsons, assuming the Nelsons had a decent modernization pre-war. Um, not really. The guns could be used, but I'm not sure if the turrets could be used. Maybe the turrets on Lexington's. But the point is, and I make this about the Lexington's quite on a quite regular basis on their 8-inch guns, under the Washington uh, Treaty, which they are built under, the US Navy can build as many cruisers and many ships under 10,000 tons as they like. So therefore, there is no reason to build that ship with those guns so high up and cause the weight issues and all the displacement issues of having those 8-inch guns on the ship. You could take those 8-inch guns and put them on another cruiser, build a cruiser and attach the cruiser to them permanently as their escort. Maybe build two cruisers. It's a cost-saving measure forced on the US Navy by Congress. Instead of getting that extra cruiser to escort, let's put the guns on the carrier. 
And that's the reason why the carriers are overweight. And actually, think about it. Think of the amount of space. Think of the amount of, the amount of things you could have got done if they'd been 5-inch guns from the beginning, anti-aircraft guns from the beginning, instead of the 8-inch guns they put in them. Even 5-inch guns I don't really like up there. I prefer them sort of mounted a la Illustrious and Ark Royal style with, you know, pairs forward and aft. So you have eight twin mounts of five inch guns. So they don't have to fire across the uh, flight deck. I just don't like things firing across the flight deck. The British had some experience of that in World War One and didn't like it. And the US Navy had access to the same data, so... But it's compromises. All these things... All ships are compromises. To a lesser or greater extent, they're a compromise. Wayne's World of Science and Technology. The sign decisions made by every and each Navy and the reasoning is fascinating. Totally fascinating. Technology year is going to be more interesting, at least from my middly warped and twisted viewpoint. It's not warped and twisted. It's just interested in technology, Wayne. Uh, R RJM-60. My late father served aboard the cruiser Salt Lake City. He was aboard the ship during the only naval engagement in North Pacific, off the Aleutian Islands. Now that is an interesting operation. Michael Borosama. Uh, curious, the USN consider the Arctic to be large cruisers, border moles on steroids. Big enough to kill any cruiser from any opponent they can big enough to kill them. How would you consider these? Large cruisers. But they are to an inheritors of the role of the Lexingtons. And that fits because Lexingtons are more cruisers than they are battle cruisers. They are battle cruisers in the in the battle cruisers provided by the Indian class. They are your largest cruisers. There's one word for battle cruisers. designed to get the cruisers and get the and wipe out. I asked Dragon Ball. Hey, uh, that's ignores you. Um, no, I do know. I I will defend Drac, and as I said, honestly, friend Drac, it's probably on a list, and he hasn't got around to it. Seriously, his due lists are miles long, and he works non-stop to try to make headway. But now the rest, I think I might have already called him in one of the videos in this playlist uh, for the S class, uh, for the S boats. Um. Drac works very, very hard. He's away with Australian me. And as we, as I, this video comes out, and he works incredibly hard. He is never not working, and he's always trying to get through the lists. He has a tremendous amount of lists to get through, and he's always trying to get through them. Honestly, there is only so many hours in a day, and there's only so much iron brew you can drink to keep going. But he does try. Ah, uh, practice. Sorry, but I'm also trying to figure out how can I say it three times fast. I wouldn't like to do a full one. I think I might go a bit. Anyway, sorry about that. Charlish me comes at about 7 o'clock at night recording a video. Uh, the fact was, 40 onwards, it became progressively more and more ambiguous that by the mid-century at least, Britain was uh, certain to be replaced as the global hegemon by some other great power. And that from half a decade or so after 1914, with two, uh, with two of only three credible candidates having themselves collapsed anyway, became obviously precise which other great power that was going to be. All of which was, let's face it, predominantly the outcome of Britain's own grossly inept imperial and foreign policy under a whole succession of cretinously stupid governments from Glasgow's first onwards, far too intervening exceptions. Simon Burke said, a great empire and little minds go ill together. Hmm. Okay. That's not American cruisers, but we'll we'll leave that to one side, and we'll get into that. We will we'll discuss this a bit. I think you have to think that the British plan was actually that the global hegemon that would replace them would be a global hegemon of the British dominions, um, the British Empire, basically the Britain and the British dominions have actually come British Commonwealth forces. That was their sort of their idea of what would replace Britain. So instead of it being a 
British Empire ruling the world, it would be the alliance of British nations ruling the world, sort of thing. I, I think that's what they were generally hoping they were going to manage to move towards. Um, it doesn't work out like that, but they do have hope. Their other thing is they do realize America's a coming power, and they notice how, in the nicest way, America's always going to become a power, because it's a basically a unified continent. So Britain realizes that's going to be a big power, and it's very difficult to deal with that in any other way other than, let's make friends with you. Because the Britain was sort of hoping that if they've got an Anglophone, the two major powers in the world, the British Empire power as a global power, or the British Commonwealth as it would become, and, the Amer and America would be the two big global powers, be agreeing mostly on most of the world's issues in terms of free trade, on economic matters, on using English as language for communication, that it would be a very peaceful, prosperous world. And between them, they could keep the world in check. And there were certain efforts being put in place to try and bring America into that fold from the early on. And in many ways, you can suggest that the modern AUKUS project... Australia, UK, US, especially if, and the Five Eyes project of Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, United States, New Zealand, these projects are, to an extent, the, how do I put it, the residual incarnation of that effort? that the English-speaking Anglophonic countries have managed to build such a deep relationship that they can work together implicitly. Yeah. Basically, Britain realized it wasn't going to be able to maintain great power status because it was going to... It's not going to be replaced, but it just felt, you know, economic strength. How, it's not going to be able to compete with America. America's going to outtake it as on its own because of its sheer size and capability and capacity and population. So the only way Britain could compete with that was by either creating a sort of permanent coalition of British, a British Commonwealth that would be far more linked in defence and foreign policy-wise and basically would be led but not ruled from London. Or by, in some way, guiding America such that instead of Britain getting surpassed, they get displaced. And so Britain doesn't lose when it is surpassed. And it's not to do with little, a great empire and little minds. It's simple economics and mass. America's population, many times that of Britain's. America's ability to get natural to access natural resources, many times that of Britain's because of the size. When America goes to war, it has a huge amount of resource available. And that's it, basically. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoy, enjoyed. This is the first in a series of com response, and they're all going to roughly aim for 20 minutes. Hey, I keep saying that for videos. They're going to roughly aim for 20 minutes. <laughs> it's 24. It's not far off. Thank you very much for watching, and take care.